Circe, a podcast of the Ostium Network. Epilogue The Ophengaria. It took a million years after the creation of Albion and the incarceration of Bruta and Hasifa for the great almighty goddess Asifa to realize she had made a mistake. The two lovers at the center of the planet had been having squabbles and disagreements for millennia, as all who are deeply in love do. But when a million years had passed, and the couple at the center of the world realized they were never going to be free that there was an entire world surrounding them with no way out, they began a spat. A spat that turned into an argument, that turned into a fight, that turned into a long, drawn-out battle, that turned into a war that lasted for many years. At the time, a violence between the two attained a level that had not been seen before throughout the entire short-lived existence of the planet Albion. Fortunately, only a million years into its very long existence, the planet had yet to spawn any life. The surface of the world was in fact still very much in upheaval, with earthquakes crisscrossing the globe, volcanoes rising and then sinking back down all over like a distant planet to observers that constantly hides behind its star, then reveals itself, then hides once more. It was on no day in particular that the two gods became especially violent. Bruta threw Hasifa against one side of the core with such a level of violence that a piece of the mantle of Albion was broken asunder and flew off into space. Not wanting to be outdone in any way, Hasifa returned the favor, and in so doing, broke off another piece of the planet and also sent it hurtling into space. Asifa observed these two momentous events on the edge of her kenning and immediately returned to the system where Albion orbited its mighty star. The great goddess worked fast, taking elements and materials from surrounding planets, and then applying some of her own secret ingredients to form an impenetrable, protective barrier that she encased Albion with. It was invisible to the naked eye, and would still allow the many geological events that were occurring and would continue to occur in Albion's long future carry out as time would allow. But it prevented Bruta and Hasifa from ever causing any external damage to the planet again. And with those two final, ever so violent acts against each other, Bruta and Hasifa entered into a period of love and respect for each other, which they promptly consummated and continued to do so for centuries to come. But Albion was already in a state of extreme upheaval. So the at times intense earthquakes and shakings of the planet due to what was occurring at its core went unnoticed. Meanwhile, the two different sized chunks of former Albion that had been hurtled into space began to settle into a stable orbit with Albion. They were on different orbital planes and, perhaps, one day, in the oh-so-very-distant future, would collide and rain down a hailstorm of meteorites that would wipe out any life on the planet within a number of years. But that story lies in the far-off future. For now, the two rocks were comfortably orbiting Albion and having little effect upon the planet. But the many revolutions helped to round and soften the edges of these rocks, so they eventually became small, round planetoids. At times, they would be bombarded by meteors and asteroids, both lacked any sort of atmosphere and so became cratered and pockmarked by these attacks from space. There was one time when a larger meteor made contact with the smaller of the two rocks and threatened to dislodge it from its orbit and send it hurtling towards the mighty sun. The great goddess Asifa had become quite fond of these two orbiting rocks that she now called the Twin Moons of Albion. She had, in fact, named them. The larger was Gamma, the smaller Eta. 
So when she observed the event that would send Etta into the sun and oblivion, she reached in and took away the errant meteor and hurtled it into another far-off galaxy. Gamma and Eta continued to orbit Albion as a twin moon system. A couple of billions of years passed, and eventually Albion became a planet teeming with diverse life. Plants and trees of every kind on seven great islands spanning the planet. In between were mighty oceans, and some not so mighty. There were mountains, there were hills, there were rivers, there were streams. There were many different peoples from all over. Most people almost never met other people from other islands. However, there was plenty of sea travel. Not all those who traveled by sea always made it to their destination, for there were strange creatures and unknown things beneath the waters. A good number of people rarely got to know or even meet the people on the other side of their large island. But there were, of course, a number that did travel greatly and did interact much with many different people. The Circe were part of this nomadic group. As for the twin moons of Gamma and Eta, they exacted a most perplexing toll upon Albion and its people, although not all that perplexing to the Circe. On certain days and times of the year, there were high tides and low tides with the waters around each of the seven islands. And at two specific points of the year, always occurring on the same day, there would be an extreme high tide that would have some extreme flooding and cause those who lived near the water's edge to temporarily move to higher ground. But in a relatively short time, it would be over and things would return to normal. On the opposite time of that special event of the year, there would be an extreme low tide where the waters appeared to be withdrawing into their respective oceans just as one takes in a deep breath. The shipping of goods and ferrying of people would be halted for a number of days, and then the waters would return and life would continue on as it ever had before, until the next extreme high tide or low tide event. To an outsider, it might be considered a harsh world that exacted a harsh toll on its inhabitants. But to those Albions who had lived on their respective islands for generations upon generations, it was simply the way the planet lived, and the way balance was achieved. It was the way Albion was, and not a single one of its many different peoples would have it any other way. I push my chair back from the table I have been recording my oral stories for over the last 12 hours. The man named Steve has been very kind, bringing me water and sustenance when I have needed it. I have not at any point asked, he has simply done it. And I have thanked him graciously and taken the drink and victuals. They have sustained me through this long first day of my storytelling. I stand and walk around the room, then go downstairs and outside to breathe fresh air. The night sky is above, dotted with a firmament of stars. The moon has risen, a bright white orb, and is almost full. I feel a pang in my heart that I see only one orb, not the bluish twin orbs I have become so used to on Albion. It seems a trivial thing to miss, but it makes this world feel so alien to me. It is very clearly not my world. But I can feel a change happening within me now. An awakening. There is a stirring of powers, of abilities I have not sensed nor felt in a very long time. It feels wonderful. A smile alights itself on my face. Then I realize I am not alone. I turn and see Steve in the doorway behind me. He has a smirk upon his face. <laughs> it's working, isn't it? I cannot help smiling wider now. I choose not to say any words, not wishing to break the moment. I give a slight nod, the smile still wide and beaming, much as it did when I first looked upon Maeve so many, many years ago. Steve can see my growing euphoria and cannot help but be a part of it. He bursts out <laughs> laughing, his joy growing with mine. And then I cannot contain it no longer. I, too, begin laughing. <laughs> 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 
We laughed together under the strange <laughs> night sky on the strange rock of the Gibraltar. Whether Jake or Monica will ever return, we know not. We are possibly the last two people of the Ostium Network. But we do not let those potential facts affect our happiness at this moment in time. We continue to laugh, our vocal sounds reaching up into the night and passing off into the reaches of space. Perhaps somewhere, at some time, those sounds may reach a certain planet with two small moons orbiting a bright star. A planet called Albion. The Sissy Podcast is written and produced by Alex C. Talander. The role of Thyra is performed by Arden Rachel. The role of Steve is performed by Alex C. Talander. The role of Kleistra is performed by Emma Shirjako. The role of Maeve is performed by Muna Husen. This episode was sound engineered by the talented blokes at Hail and Well Met Podcasts. If you're looking for some other shows once you finish Cersei, be sure to check out their work at hailandwellmetpodcast.com. The music featured in this episode is Sunrise by Kick Hat. Lost Time, There Is Romance, both by Kevin McClue, under the Creative Commons license. The Cersei Podcast is a podcast of the Ostium Network. You can support Cersei as well as all other Ostium Network shows by supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash ostiumpodcast, where you can get access to a whole variety of bonus material, including many episodes for Ostium, Cersei, and Manifestations, as well as the Ostium Files and the Behind the Ostium series. You will also get access to a new Cersei miniseries all about her lost love, Pragma and behind-the-scenes episodes about Cersei called Cersei Confidential. Once again, that's patreon.com slash ostiumpodcast. Thank you so much for listening to the Cersei Podcast. This story came out of the character of Thyra as she took me along on her journey, which is very far from over, and I'm delighted to have you all with me for the ride.